So, um, Simone, thank you very much for giving us this presentation just now, and thank you for coming down to Manchester. So, I'm wondering, like, you have a dual role of being a researcher as well as a program manager um, in Lancaster. So, can you please introduce yourself and your background, and how is your uh, research and your work? Yeah. Um, Yes, my name is Simone Corsi. Um, I, I work for Lancaster University. Um, as you said, I have a dual role. I was initially appointed or recruited by Lancaster University um, for being the program manager of a program called Lancaster China Catalyst Program, mm -hmm. um, which is a program that helps the, to create and develop R&D partnerships between UK SMEs and Chinese organizations in Guangdong province. Uh, but given my background, um, which is uh, really, I have a PhD in management that I've taken from um, Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Pisa, Italy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have a research background focusing on R&D internationalization in China and reverse innovation. Mm -hmm. So when I joined Lancaster University, I've asked also a research affiliation, mm -hmm. because of course I, will, I would like to maintain the research perspective in my, in my job. Mm -hmm. They were so kind to give it one, and uh, so that's my second role. I, I and uh, currently I use uh, the outcome and the results of um, the program I'm managing mm -hmm. as my empirical basis for my research. Can you please introduce a little bit about the program? It's called Lancaster China Catalyst Program. So, what is this program about? The idea started from the fact that. Um, there are two strong elements in this program. One of them is Lancaster University being very, very good in uh, working with businesses, um, helping SMEs to develop their innovation abilities mm -hmm. and their leadership capabilities and to grow their markets. Uh, at the same time, Lancaster University is, uh, um, has very strong links with China mm -hmm. and in particular with Guangdong province mm -hmm. for a number of research activities that they've been um, undertaking for the last at least 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, what they thought, they thought to merge these two things together and uh, they ideated this, um, um, this program uh, which has the main aim of helping UK SMEs to enter the Chinese market mm -hmm. through R&D. Mm -hmm. um, so we help UK companies to meet and develop a relationship with Chinese organizations, which could be research organizations or um, companies. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with them in order for them to develop an R&D project. And once they are ready to undertake their R&D project, we resource them with a mm -hmm. team of postgraduate students mm -hmm. that will work with them and for them in the UK and then in China. It sounds very exciting. And back to the topic you just uh, presented about. It's called re reverse innovation. So could you please uh, introduce a little bit this concept? Yeah. How, how do you define it? And what is your observation in the context of your, your, your own research and also this program, you know, the connotation of yeah. reverse innovation? Um, well, reverse innovation is really um, a concept that sets itself against a very traditional idea of the international dimension of innovation. Mm -hmm. So in tr traditionally, um, innovation is always looked at as uh, being most likely originated in advanced economies before trickling down, before being commercialized in developing economies. But the locus of innovation was really advanced economies mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. Uh, what we have seen for the last 10 years, it's been a growing trend of innovation being originated some, to some extent mm -hmm. in developing economies before trickling up to advanced countries. So the idea of reverse innovation is really the sense of this reverse flow of innovation, not anymore solely from advanced to eco um, emerging economies, but now also the other way around, from emerging economies to advanced economies. That's what I looked at for my PhD. And in the context of um, the companies we I'm working with right now, mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing some of them working for the development of new products and services, mm -hmm. which are not only for the Chinese market, co-developed with a Chinese organization for the Chinese market, 
but for the global markets. Mm -hmm. So clearly, they are looking at China not only as a market, but as, an, as a source of potential global innovation. Um, I'm wondering what is your observation in terms of the factors determining um, the patterns of reverse innovation because you talk about quite a portfolio of different types. Yeah, well in the paper I just presented uh, it was a very specific paper focusing on uh, um, host country factors so mm. foreign companies operating in China what kind of factors are triggering reverse innovation processes for these companies. Um, what we looked at during in that paper is basically that um, there are three dimensions that can uh, have an effect of innovation activities of foreign multinational corporations in China mm -hmm. and uh, um, influencing them into uh, developing new products not only for China but also for the global markets. And these two factor, three factors, three dimensions mm -hmm. are the state intervention or regulatory issues uh, the local market peculiarities, very specific ways of doing business or conceptualizing um, new ways of uh, using the product mm -hmm. and, uh, and the local competition which uh, um, undertake very different uh, technological pathways from the ones that foreign companies are used to and that really um, put a question mark mm -hmm. on their traditional way of uh, developing new products mm -hmm. and technologies. So um, there were very interesting debates just now and not really finished yet. It's about intellectual property in China. And that's also your, the first question you got from the local firms before you started the program. Um, so if you would, uh, it, could you please summarize what is the, what's actually going on out there, the real picture, and what kind of patterns do you really observe? Well, um, I'm not an IP expert, mm -hmm. so that's a word of caution. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure the person in the audience uh, was much more, had, uh, he had a very different view mm -hmm. from my own perspective. And I'm sure he was genuinely honest and he has a point for mm -hmm. that. Um, my view is that uh, companies are overstressing the importance of um, not overstressing the import, overstressing the risk of IP infringement in China. Mm -hmm. um, there is a risk, and uh, and uh, and it may happen, it very well happen that your technology or your trademark is somehow infringed. Mm -hmm. uh, but China, I look at the positive side of things. China is doing a lot. Chinese government is doing a lot. It's putting a lot of effort into the development of a proper IP regime mm -hmm. and in trying to set up a context where IP rights can be enforced properly. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a long way to go, but the idea of China being the copycatter um, that we always hear on the news, mm -hmm. on popular newspapers and magazines, it's gone. I think it's very gone. Mm -hmm. So it seems like we are seeing a more complex, but maybe more encouraging picture for... Yeah, I think so. I think so. And that's why, that's why we struggled, really. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and um, I think, absolutely, I look at the bright side mm -hmm. of things. So things are improving. I'm, in the context of the program I'm managing, mm -hmm. uh, there is the Chinese government involved, mm -hmm. the Guangdong government in mm -hmm. particular. And, uh, and Guangdong government, um, has funding available for UK-China R&D partnerships set up within our program. Mm -hmm. But in order for that funding to be unlocked, the government requires a very detailed cooperation agreement between the UK and Chinese organization. Mm -hmm. And in that cooperation agreement, they explicitly say that there needs to be an agreement on IP rights. Mm -hmm. So you can't get away from a um, international cooperation between a UK and a Chinese company on technological issues mm -hmm. without signing an IP agreement if you are to be funded by the government. And I think this is a very strong sign. Yeah, yeah, it's a good gesture. Um, my final question would be, um, what would you say to uh, UK companies 
in terms who want, especially the small and medium-sized ones, who want to enter the Chinese market, either to do maybe broader trade or some R&D activities. What do you what do you have to say to them, and also maybe to UK policymakers? What, what would you? Yeah. Well, but to UK SMEs, I would advise them to. Um, First of all, trying to understand if China is really a priority for them. If it's not a priority, don't get started, because mm -hmm. otherwise it becomes very, very difficult. You will find a lot of obstacles. And if it's not a priority, you'll just step away very soon. Um, second, I would, uh, I would advise them to find some support from... There is available support. There is a program, for example, uh, that, that uh, provides support to UK SMEs mm -hmm. in order for them to be able to um, solve all the issues that they will find through, uh, through their um, China-related initiative. Mm -hmm. To the policy makers, I would advise them to provide funding for additional support. Mm -hmm. UK SMEs are finding very difficult to internationalize in China, and that's understandable. There is also an IP issue, mm -hmm. but there is a cultural issue, there is a distance issue, uh, which is not only geographical, there is a language issue, yeah. there is a need for understanding the local context and the local market, which is very different from the one that they are used to. Mm -hmm. uh, so all these things need to be supported by government, mm -hmm. local and national, national impact.